you have your Bible, would you turn with me to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, is where we'll be this morning. And if you are late coming in or you are late joining us online, because we always get a bump about 15 minutes in, isn't that interesting? Whether you're in the room or online, I've been around church for a long time. Within 15 minutes, people show up. That's how it works. Uh, I'm Tim. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I'll be uh, bringing our teaching time today. And so find 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and that's where we'll be this morning. And before we, j- before we jump into the text this morning and see what God has to say to us through ver- 1 John 4, 1 through 6, I wanted in- to uh, encourage you all who are married, unmarried, married again, looking to be married, around married people, or think one day possibly marriage could be at some point in your future or at some point in your past. I think that covers everybody, right? If you are listening to me and breathing and somewhat alert and oriented, I want to invite you to our Vertical Marriage Conference, which is coming up next weekend, February 26th and 27th. This is a, this is a, a virtual conference. So you you can attend in sweatpants and, you know, that old work t-shirt from that thing you went to 10 years ago or whatever. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you and your spouse or you by yourself or some of you single guys that live with others, you need to go. Like, <laughs> you do. And so, the reason is because we all have a way to improve in marriage. Whether you're at a two and you want to go to a four or you're at an eight and want to go to a 10, we all have things we need to learn, no matter how long we've been married. But another part of that is, and I'm talking to those who have gray hair in the room, and the Bible says gray hair and wisdom kind of go together. And so, and I have a couple, so I don't have that much wisdom. Uh, so in that, we need you to show up because we need to hear from you. I mean, we, like, I, I'm on 14 years of marriage, and I can't figure out. Uh, uh, my, uh, I have a dog, a, a hound. Her name's Rosie. And man, I love that dog. She is just awesome. And my wife told me, she said, I think you love Rosie more than me. And I said, baby, no, I don't. I love you all the same, you know? <laughs> and I, I don't know why she was upset about that, but maybe you're 15, I'll learn. I don't know. We're into that right now. But I'm just kidding. We all have a way of learning because when you first get married, you have so many ideas that are just half filled, if not like 10% filled, that the other 90%, you have no idea what you're getting into. But it's important that we learn the difference between truth and falsehoods when it comes to marriage. And every married person in the room or online said, amen. Amen. We got to figure that out. You're going to figure it out one way or the other. And so it's important that we do that. And I want to invite you to do that. It's 20 bucks. If your uh, spouse isn't able to go uh, or it's just you by yourself, uh, it's $10. And so we just, uh, it's pretty reasonable. And if you can't do that, just ask the person next to you. Uh, that's the beauty of the bride of Christ. They'll cover it, you know. And so we'll be glad to make sure that you get there uh, one way or the other. And, you know, marriage isn't the only thing that we have a tendency to go into believing half-truths or, depending on those that are around us, learning half-truths. I remember in the military all of the time, I had people around me who had miserable marriages, and uh, on top of that, we're making poor decisions that were leading to that and couldn't figure out why. You see, culturally, they had embraced an idea of what marriage is sometimes and other times what it isn't. We, we do this with many things, and it's important that we know the difference between something that's half true and all the way true, because a half true is a lie. Yeah, we don't want to be base, base our lives and our marriages on lies, do we? And so, what we need to understand today goes into the text that it's important we know how to distinguish and discern between what is half truth and what is the full truth. In fact, I have some things today here that are going to help us understand that. Uh, the first is a cake. This is not a cake. This is half of a cake. Actually, this isn't even half of a cake. You need more than just this to make a cake, and you actually have to bake the cake to make it. But if I were to try to come to your house and say, I'll bring dessert, and you opened up that 13 by 9 pan and saw this, you would say, Tim, you're crazy. Now, I want you to know that even though I would say that this could be a cake, this is actually not a cake. 
And I'm not, you know, promoting Pillsbury over anything else. It just happens to be the one that I pulled from my pantry. And so, babe, there you go. I stole our cake, our half a cake, our part of cake. This is not actually a cake. And these I actually took from my son. And this morning he said, why are you taking my blocks? I said, I need them to teach people at church. And then he said, okay, I guess I'll share. So when you see Tolson at 11 o'clock, tell him, thank you for those blocks, unless it's a bad illustration. Then say, hey, you shouldn't let dad take the blocks. And so in this, here's some blocks. And I, I don't know what this is supposed to be, but you're actually, you're supposed to be able to build a bridge from this. Oh, and then there's Thomas the Train right there, and he's really awesome. He has something to do with the bridge, and if you build the bridge right, it can actually bear a pretty good load of weight. But like this by itself, without building anything together, if I were to say this could build a bridge, I'm no engineer, but I would imagine that this can't hold much weight at all, right? If you're an engineer in the room, correct me later and say, no, that actually can hold some weight, but drive a car over it with your family inside over some water, would you do that? Yeah, it's not going to hold that much weight, is it? Now, I have a, another thing to help us understand the text today. I have some math. Now, I'm no mathematician, but I would probably guess that in a sound math class, 2 plus 2 equals, well, not 2, right? Now, if you're a mathematician and you say, well, there's an imaginary number with some particular whatever that, okay, whatever, don't kill the illustration. But here's the point. You understand that 2 plus 2 does not equal 2, even though 2 is half of the answer. So if I were to turn this in in math class, uh, which I wouldn't do, not because I wouldn't have the right answer, but because I never turned in my homework, if I were to turn this in in math class, my teacher would say, that's not right. And if I said, well, that's half of the truth, right? She would say, that's, that's true, it's half the truth, but it's still wrong. You see, half of the equation or half of the right answer is still false. And I have this last thing, it's a uh, million dollars. It's not actually a million dollars. It is uh, an IOU for one million dollars as inspired by one of the greatest movies of all time. And just to help you understand that uh, this is not actually a million dollars, even though underneath it, it looks like a million-dollar bill. Number one, million-dollar bills don't actually exist. Maybe they do. I don't know. But it has a sticker on the top that says Hobby Lobby $1.29 because that's what I bought it for. And on the inside, its only worth is that of chocolate because that's what it's filled with. But if I were to hand this to you and say… I want you to know that this is worth $1 million, just as good as a $1 million cash that I owe you. You know why it is a worthless gift with absolutely no value? Because the one giving it to you does not have a $1 million, <laughs> nor if I owe you a $1 million, will I ever be able to pay you a $1 million. I can print some stuff from my printer at home, but that's not going to work out too well. And so, that being said, what I want you to see is that a half-baked cake is not a cake at all, even if I claim it. Uh, some half-built uh, bridge isn't a bridge that can bear any amount of weight and will end up destroying something. Some half-right answer is an answer for sure with parts of the real answer, but does not actually have the truth, the true answer. And some worthless note, even if I give it a good argument behind it and say it's sweet to the taste and I promise it's good, does not make it worth anything at all. Y'all, the text today is going to help us see that we need to be careful in discerning the difference between the absolute truth of God found in Jesus Christ coming in the flesh and some other partial truth, some half-baked, half-built, half-true, worthless truth ultimately that's taught to us by the world around us. You see, 1 John is written to us from the, uh, from the position, the posture of John the Apostle. Uh, John at this point, it's like 95 to 100 A.D., somewhere in there when he's writing 1 John. Man, he is an old man by any measure. He has lived a life. He has seen and walked with Jesus since he was a young person. 
And he is looking over a group of people as an apostle with the heart of a pastor and the love of a father, and he's seeing that they have a tendency to believe some kind of half-baked, half-built, half-true, worthless truth in place of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And we all know that a half-truth is a lie, and a half-truth will lead to a half-life, a life that is not consistent with how God designed your life to be in Jesus Christ. As Pastor Eric has killed it, in a good way, in a good way, he has killed it in a good way. Every single week, we've learned that the, the people that John is writing to, that they, they said they walked in the way of God, but they were super tempted to walk in their own way. They said that they knew the truth of God, but man, they ignored the basic truth that they need forgiveness of sin. They said that they knew life in God, but they would pick and choose which commandments they followed for their lives, usually following the ones that are most convenient to validate their own desires. They would keep God's commandments, but justified hating people. They said they loved God, but they would define loving God through terms that aligned God with their desire for earthly possessions, power, and prominence. You see, they took the beautiful message of God in Jesus Christ and they twisted it a little bit, believed others who would teach twisting just a little bit, away from the truth. So what they believed had some aspects of Christianity, but the core, the thing under the thing, what it was made of, if you look at it, no matter the claim, when you take open, when you open the wrapper, is some kind of weird half-baked, half-built, half-true, worthless version of what it means to be a follower of Jesus because they had taken the truth of who God is and believed some kind of weird, half-baked, half-built, half-true, worthless version of who they thought Jesus was. You see, we know that this is dangerous. And John knew that this is dangerous. This isn't the first time that John faced people who were this way. Who, would, who were face to face with the reality of the way and the truth and the life, and yet chose to go their own way, chose to believe their own truth, chose to live their own life or defined life with God as what they wanted and God would fit into it. But even more than that, do you remember in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John wrote one of them. He was there for all of this. More than that, to, to do their own thing that justified their half-knowledge of Scripture, that supported their view, and that, their view, and that's the danger. And do you recall in the Gospels, in the New Testament, do you, do you remember, remember Matthew 2? Y'all, mm, read this when you get home or make a note or whatever. When uh, King Herod gets a visit from uh, the wise men and says, uh, and they say the king of the Jews has been born, his star's in the sky. And so he calls, uh, 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 he calls the, 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 the chief priests and the scribes, the people who literally know God's word, memorized it from the time they were little kids. He calls them together and says, where will the Christ be born? And they know where to go to Scripture to find it, and yet they never go. Do you remember when Jesus said to a group of people who were raised in culture, knowing Scripture, man, there's like a wide way, and there's a narrow way, and there's not like a middle way of halfness. You're either on the super wide way, and that goes to destruction, or like the narrow way, and that leads to life. There's no middle, narrow truth. Do you remember how many times in the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, just just count it, or throughout the Gospels. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said. And he would quote Scripture or a teaching, and a teaching that at its 
that it's, it's at its root was godly, but as it grew in that culture and was twisted by manipulation, would lead to something that was inconsistent with God's Word overall, even though it was based on it. Do you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? Even if you're not familiar with church world in the Bible, you've heard this story before, how Jesus tells it to help a a lawyer, someone who knows God's Word and all of the different tangential reasons that it can and can't be applied and all of that, a lawyer, to help, he tells this parable to help that kind of a person see, man, it's not that you don't know Scripture and that you're not trying to keep some of the commandments. It's that you don't love your neighbor, therefore you don't keep the very commandments that you No, I want you to know that in the Gospels, John had seen this over and over again. A group of people who claimed God and had some half-baked, half-built, half-true, worthless religion, Jesus said. You know, the, the Gospels aren't the only place you find this in Scripture. Do you remember how even to His own disciples, Jesus reminded them, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Abide in me, John 15. Abide in me, Jesus says, and apart from me, you can do nothing. And from the beginning of time in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were tempted by Satan's half-baked, half-built, half-right, worthless truth. Yes, God did say this, but he also missed this part as well. Do you see how this works in the church? Do you remember that Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 16, he didn't say, although this is so important, and man, we're not downplaying this at all, He didn't say, make sure you have the whole Bible memorized, although you ought to, you should. He didn't say to make sure you don't stray, ensure that you are attend faithfully every week. Although, I mean, honestly, if, if you're a Christian and you're not gathering in some form of worship every week, man, I don't know what to tell you. The Bible isn't your friend in that aspect. God is not your friend. Like, there's something wrong there. It's so interesting to me as a young pastor who happens to share the name Timothy. Paul, an older pastor, looks at this young pastor and says, you you want to know how to make sure that the people around you are walking straight, that your teaching is good, that you stick to the truth, that you're living out the truth. He says, keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching persist in this. Don't give up. Like, keep going at it. For by so doing, you will say both yourself and your hearers. Because the idea of believing some half-truth is the work of Satan from the beginning of time against God's people made in His image, designed to worship and honor Him. That's what He taught in the garden. He taught them some, something half true, that caused them to fail in their faith in God. That's what Satan does. He is a master of deception. He is a liar. And he is like really, really good at lying because like the best deceptions, all of his lies contain some kind of truth. Satan plays a role in this text today. This is why, man, we got to spend some time on this and figure it out. Satan plays a role in this text today, and it's important that you know Satan never outright denies the reality of life in God through faith in Jesus Christ. Instead, here's what he does, and after polling our pastoral staff, I asked, what is it that you see in your area? I asked Pastor Eric, what are some things that you see just as a church, having been a pastor for 30 plus years or whatever, having been here for 17 years, and just knowing the the world of church, not just First Norfolk, but the world of church. And here's what came out, that what he does 
is he, 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 he provides some kind of synthetic life or some kind of synthetic faith or some kind of synthetic God that has some characteristics of the real thing, but is false. He twists the idea of a right relationship with God and says, yeah, a relationship with God, super important. You find that in every world religion, do you not? He takes the idea of a relationship with God and makes it one you can earn rather than one that's given through faith in Jesus Christ. He downplays the danger of sin. And then he slams you with its consequences. You've experienced this before. Where all of a sudden you begin to think, man, this isn't a big deal. And then the consequences are a massive deal. In fact, the Bible says the consequences of sin are death. Oh, but Satan keeps that away. And then what happens when you fall into it? He begins to destroy your faith. Is that what Christians really do? Is that who you… You can't be a Christian if you're like that. And see, the other half of that truth, the other half of that truth is that I would be like that, but by the grace of God, He's rescued me from sin. I would be, man, I would be so dead in my sin. But man, I know that if I confess my sin, He is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And do you see how this works? How he harps on your weakness and fails to mention the hope found in Christ. He allows you to have a view of God, but he muddles the waters of who God really is or what his truth really is or what the hope really is so that God becomes some weird, like, impotent panhandler that that makes no demands of your life and just kind of wants you to, to do whatever you see fit and give him whatever you think you should. How different is that than the God of the Bible? You see, this is where we jump into this text. Because John knows this, God knows this about us, y'all, you know this about us. And so what we need to see in this text today is the concern that God has for those of us who would play the deception game. And maybe even not knowingly, but along the way when we realize that some version of the truth we have believed is actually, well, some half-baked, half-built, half-right, worthless version of God's truth. And I want you to know this text is coming from an old man, probably older than all in this room, and from God who is ageless. Like, I don't know how old that is. It's like super old. And this text comes, look at verse 1 of 1 John chapter 4, and you'll see the tone of the text of what this is. Because where Satan would take this and say, you're a terrible, terrible person. How dare you? I hate this about you. You see, God in His truth, John to those people, writing to church people who believe, making sure that their life lines up with the truth that they say they believe. He's going to take a different approach in this text. Look at verse 1. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Do you see the tone of this text? The tone of this text is fatherly. John is speaking tenderly to them. You know, there's a right way to say hard truth, and there's a wrong way to say hard truth. And you can be right but wrong at the top of your lungs, can't you? Every married person in the room who knows that. And the reality is that John has every authoritative reason to lay into them for this, but instead he knows what it is to walk in the way and the truth and the life to be loved by somebody unconditionally. And he has that same approach as he's speaking to those to whom he's ministering to. Uh, This term, the feeling of it, the feeling of beloved is what we don't, I mean, when was the last time you used the term beloved to somebody around you, right? Like last time you read through Song of Solomon, maybe? I mean, that's about it, right? The feeling of this text is like like a dad sitting down with his teenage son or daughter, a good godly dad, that kind of feeling, 
and saying, listen, man, I, I want you to know, I need you to listen to me. Like, I, I know that you don't think you should, but I need you to trust that I'm older than you, that I know more than you, because I've been around longer and I've seen more. I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. And I need you to hear what I'm going to say because it's going to feel really hard, but you've got to know that it's coming out of love. Do you feel that when I read the word beloved? He says, beloved, I'm sitting with you. I'm John, man, an old apostle, God in Scripture sitting with you and saying, listen, don't believe every spirit. And look at how he specifically identifies what the spirits are. They're these false teachers that have gone out into the world. That's an important concept because in the Bible, the greatest threat to the church is not like some uh, uh, governmental decision or whatever. Every time the worst, most extreme governmental decision was made, like we're going to destroy everyone in the church, not just like a mask mandate or whatever. I mean like literally like destroy them. They scattered like crazy and the church grew like, grew like wildfire. Some of the greatest places of revival in the world are happening under governments with extreme authority. God is, God is speaking to us and letting us know not to believe every spirit, but to test the spirits to see if they are from God. And this is going to be something important for us to know as the beloved children of God. Because I would venture to say that you, you may have some half-truth in your life if you're honest, that you need to twist back to make sure that it is in line with the truth of the Scripture and the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've felt in your own heart what the great hymnist Robert Robertson so eloquently penned in 1758. God, I'm prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And perhaps more than ever in this day and age, everybody has a platform and a voice to make a message known, don't they? And so many of those messages are leading so many astray. And John has a way now for you and me as followers of Jesus to come by us as an apostle, as a father of the church, as a father in the faith, no matter what your age is in the room. And God, as our Father, comes beside us in this passage, and He helps us see that there is a way for us to know what is from God and what is not from God, because the line can be so blurry sometimes as everyone has an opinion about everything always. Now, we're, su we're supposed to test these teachings that come our way. Not for, is it from the Bible, do they use a passage of Scripture? Y'all, I've been a pastor long enough to know that we can use Scripture to justify just about anything we want, because I've seen it and I've done it. Not as to whether or not it's from an expert. Y'all, recent days has told us it's easy to masquerade uh, evil with the term doctor and as an apologist with no actual degree, even though that was his term. And what does it mean to test? That's what God's calling us to do. And here's what He's going to give us in this text. He's going to show us how to understand from this test what is the actual true way of God? What is the actual uh, uh, way, truth of God? What is the life that God has for us in Jesus Christ so that every pathway is tested and every teaching is tested and every uh, perceived spiritual truth behind something is tested to see, is this what God has for me in Jesus Christ? In essence, here's what he's going to teach us. And then we're going to jump into the rest of the text. He's going to help us understand that we, we avoid half-truths 
when we know who Jesus is and who He is not. And He's going to teach us that in verses 2 through 3. And then He's going to go look at verse, we're going to look at verses 4 through 6, and we're going to see that we avoid half-truths when we know who we are in Christ and who we are not. And these are so important because God's design for you in Jesus Christ is to know God fully. Every emotion, every feeling, every thought, every action taken captive to who He is. To know God and not some synthetic version of Him. And one of the ways to do that, John says, is that we would know who Jesus is and who He's not. And that we would know who we are in Christ and who we are not. So that being said, look at verses 2 through 3. Read this with me. It says, by this you know the Spirit of God. Okay, this is good. I want to know this, right? This is what I want to know. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit, okay, remember these spirits are behind this teaching. Behind every teacher is a spirit. We want to figure out what's going on behind that, even if there's some language that's consistent with Christian theology. Verse 3, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is, was coming and now is in the world already. John makes the standard one phrase. Y'all, this is why I love John, because I can be a complicated thinker, and I need someone to think simply for me sometimes. John boils down everything into one phrase and says, here's how you know what's from God. Here's how to know if it's a half-baked, half-built, half-true, worthless truth, or if this is actually the real way, the real truth, the real life leading you to faith in, G in, in Jesus Christ, leading you in a pathway to actually fulfilling the life that God has given you. Here's how you can know every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But what does that mean? Just look at this text. Who was Jesus from John's perspective? Jesus is the one from the very beginning in chapter 1. Look at the verses. Man, with that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and we touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest. And we, man, we have seen it. And we, we testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard and proclaim, we proclaim to you also, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus. And we're writing these things so that our joy, your and my joy, may be complete." When John talks about Jesus, he's talking about the one whom he lived with, whom he rubbed shoulders with, whom he spoke to, who he heard teach, who he was with as miracle after miracle occurred. John is talking about a specific person of Jesus. Jesus, not just a human who was born, but Jesus the Christ. What does that mean? Christ is a term that means uh, anointed one, uh, sometimes intermixed with the word Messiah in Scripture. What in the world is Christ? Because other than maybe in a derogatory phrase or just generally in church settings, we don't see and understand what this title really means like John would. In Scripture, the Christ is the one that was promised in Genesis that would rule his people forever. In Scripture, the Christ is the one who is from God and speaks for God. In Scripture, he is the Son of God. He is sent from God through King David's line who will take the iniquity of God's people. He is the exalted one so marred that he wouldn't be recognized. He poured out his blood so that the wrath of God would be satisfied. The Christ fulfilled the word of God so that God would ultimately be glorified. 
Christ was incarnated as man for eternity, and so for eternity, he is the God-man deified. He bore your grief and your sorrows so that you could be sanctified. He was afflicted by God. The Christ was pierced by God. The Christ was condemned by God. The Christ was crushed by God. He was killed by God. He was raised by by God. And because it pleased God, it is through Christ that we can be saved by God. And the Christ now lives. Jesus Christ lives to intercede on behalf of us for God. I want you to know that he is the eternal one who rules his people. He unites his people. He shepherds his people. He secures his people. He is peace for his people. And he is great to the ends of the earth. And the Christ is reigning and ruling today and will come back to reign again. This is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has come. He has come in the flesh. Do you not know, church, John was with him. Oh, church, do you not know? He was really crucified. And like he really died. And then he really rose from the dead. And they really touched and felt him afterwards and ate with him. And they really learned from him afterwards. And they really watched him ascend. And he is really still, he is really still reigning. And he is really coming back. This is Jesus Christ says, come in the flesh. You see, the distinguishing mark of true Christian teaching is not just that Jesus existed, but that Jesus is the only anointed one of God who lives to lead us to be alive and to live in him. And here's what John says, if the teaching you are hearing leads you to see that Jesus is the only anointed one from God, and that the only anointed one from God has come in the flesh in Jesus Christ. And that because he is Messiah Christ, our posture is to submit to him every thought, every action, every idea, every feeling. That's what the Christ is. He rules. If if a teaching aligns with that, it is from the Spirit of God. But if there's a teaching that at the end of the teaching or underneath its foundation desires to misalign your life with becoming like Jesus like that, by submitting to Him like that, by being the everything and all in all that everyone forever, everywhere will ever need. If a teaching misaligns with that, it is not from God. You see, if we're not careful we can be prone to have a theology that uses the language of Christian theology but misses the reality that Jesus really came, that He really desires to rule every area of your life, that He really is coming back. If we're not careful, we can be more consumed with what's going on around us and embrace teachings that justify our angry behavior rather than the teachings of Christ which cause us to be humble, serve, love, obey, confess sin, love one another, gather with the saints, serve the lowliest. Do you see how this half-truth can invade and how we're prone to do that. You see, what he wants them to know is that this teaching that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is way more than just saying, oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus lived one day. It's saying, Jesus is my king, and forever, forever he has come and rules everything about me. Now, in this, Knowing who Jesus is and knowing who He is not is so vitally important to understanding and identifying half-truths. You see, look at verse 3. He says, in every spirit that does not confess Jesus… Okay, so that's shorthand for all the stuff that, that John just mentioned and said. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus like that is not from 
God. And then he says where it's from, and this is where it gets tricky. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Whoa, right? What a term. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Look at this thing phrase by phrase. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus Christ as Lord come in the flesh is not from God. Every teaching that would teach something less than who Jesus is and who you are in Him is not from God, and you're to test it. Because ultimately, here's the danger. It's not neutral. Ultimately, that teaching is coming from somewhere. Behind every teaching is a spirit, and behind every spirit that teaches you to not believe in Jesus like you ought to is from, in this text, the Antichrist. The Antichrist in the Bible is not harmless in this term. It's a little s, spirit, and a little a, Antichrist. It's not the guy in Revelation, but rather what he aims to seek and do. He's not the ultimate one, but the teachings align with what the Antichrist desires to do in the Bible. Now, here's a little theological lesson. God's servant is Christ. He is the object. He is the defender. He is the sustainer of faith in God, and He is God. Satan's servant is the Antichrist who seeks to do what Satan does in Scripture, destroy people's believing fully in Jesus. And so the Antichrist's goal is to get you to not believe in God in the Bible, but rather, is, which is ultimately what Satan is trying to do. Like this is why in, in chapter 3, verse 8, uh, John goes to the, just straight to the point. Uh, Jesus came uh, so to destroy the works of the devil, uh, the sins that the people were embracing rather than believing in Jesus. And so he wants you to know that, that uh, the way we avoid this is to know who Jesus is and any teaching that helps us see Jesus as less than who he is, as believe in a version of Jesus than, that's less than who he is, has a spiritual dimension behind it, a very real dangerous dimension behind it, and we have to be weary of it. So knowing who Jesus is and knowing who he is not any teaching that teaches us something other than what God says in Scripture Jesus is, is to be avoided at all costs. But in that, this is where it gets good. And this is where we'll begin to close out today. Look at verse 4. Because avoiding half-truths by knowing who Jesus is and who He's not is, well, is part of the work that we get to do as followers of Jesus. But in that also, we avoid half-truths when we know who we are in Christ and who we are not. Look at verse 4, the very beginning. He again brings in this idea of, man, kid, I want to talk to you. And if that's weird for you, receive it from John, receive it from God. He says, man, child, I want to talk to you. Little children, I want to talk to you. You are from God. Do you see the you-them comparison here? What's the difference? The difference in this text is that you are from God, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And then verse 5, they are from the world. That John wants them to see there's like a super narrow way that leads to life, and there's a wide way, and there's a difference between those who are of God and those who are of the world. And in this text, John wants you to know, if you feel like, man, what am I believing? He wants you to know that it's not a fair fight between the world and God in your life. That God always wins. That the truth of the gospel always prevails. That God will overcome because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You, beloved child of God, have been made of God and will overcome the world for he is greater. And this is now where we begin to get to the hard part of application. Because what we have to do is now figure out what does it look like, what does it feel like, what does it smell like to 
be those of God's people who don't believe everything that's brought before us, but actually test it to see whether it's from God, to see if this is teaching me who, uh, uh, to see if this is teaching me who Christ really is rather than who He's not and trying to cause me to believe that, to see if this teaching that's coming before me, you all to do this with my teaching this morning, if this teaching that's coming before you is teaching you who you are in Christ or trying to teach you something that you aren't in Christ to get you to be that way instead. It's hard to do this. I, I, uh, I remember um, years ago in the military, this is a, a, a moment that sticks in my mind. Uh, we, I was dealing with uh, some things and uh, with the team I was working with and uh, one of the things was kind of the moral integrity of some things that were going on. And then also the moral integrity of God, who God calls me to be in Jesus. And as a, a man of any age, especially as a young man, uh, there were particular types of magazines that were around in the bathroom and everywhere. That I, just, I just thought, man, I can't be around this. And we, I was talking to another guy who's a believer. Out of 15 of us, there were two, you know, and so we're like, what do we do here? And so uh, one day, I, 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 we were at a group meeting, a team meeting, where this kind of thing's discussed. And I said, hey, w would you guys mind, man, I totally get it, but would you guys mind if you just put that stuff away? If you just kind of removed it from the bathroom and just like, I, look, I get it, man, you, but like, could you just put that stuff away? And man, you would have thought like, you would have thought like I just like kicked their children or something. I mean, like, the outrage against such a uh, one said, well, you can put your Bible around. Like, well, okay, I, okay, thank you. You know, but that's not what I'm asking. Uh, I'm asking, would you just put that away? And y'all, this is, this is what, it, what it felt like to wrestle with, to wrestle with this idea of, man, I'm, I'm of God. I'm not of the world, and I got to figure this out. In that, in, that, in that moment, I knew, man, I just blew it with some opportunities. There were tables that I was at that I was no longer invited to be at anymore simply by that statement, that gentle statement of something that was really important. And that feeling, you've been there before, that feeling, that's, that's what it feels like to know, man, this, this just is not a truth that I need to engage with in my life because it's some weird half-built, half baked, false, uh, half-true, worthless idea of something that God has said. In fact, I'll just put it like this. If you are a Christian, remove porn from your life completely. Now, that's not necessarily to the text, but it is tangential to the story. It was a very real reality where I had to figure out, like, goodness, like, how do I who, how do I line up what I'm doing with who I am in Christ? This is how it feels to go against that, and I haven't always succeeded in every work environment when it comes to that, or, or been a follower of Jesus in situations where I might lose a seat at the table or lose influence for some reason, or whatever. But at the end of the day, John is coming beside us who have to walk that day in and day out. God is coming beside you, walking with you day in and day out. And He's saying, listen, little kid, man, I've been there, and I know what it's like. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to have a culture of half-truths around you and have to stand up for the truth. And I want you to know it is so vitally important, and you got to know you are not them. That's the hard part, because walking in Jesus makes you feel, look, and smell different. So, what do we do with this text? I'll look at verse 6, and then we'll close out. John says, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever, whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. John lands with this, just like you would with your teenage son or daughter, and say, listen, man, whoever you're listening to to teach these things, these half-truths to you, would you just think about listening to something else? And so that's where we're going to end today. With the question of, 
what have you been listening to? You can walk backwards through this text and say, what have I been listening to? Those who are of God listen to the things of God. Those who are of the world listen to the things of the world. Those who, uh, the, the things of the world and those teachings come from the enemy of God. The things that teach me to submit fully to Jesus in every arena of my life, those things come from God. And so I need to test them. And it begins by asking the question, what am I listening to? What do you need to test this week? Let's spend some time praying and then worshiping the Lord. Father, would you give us wisdom today to find out what we ought to be listening to? Lord, give us wisdom on what we do listen to, what drives our passions and our emotions and our view of God and our view of others. God, give every person in this room and every person watching online discernment to know the difference between the things that sound like they're from God and the things that are from God, the things that contain an aspect of Christian language and the things that actually compel us to believe more deeply in Jesus Christ and His way for our life. God, I ask that You would give us courage to identify where what we are listening to does not align from You, with You. And Lord, would You give us wisdom to listen to You and to Your way alone. God, that we would live the true and real full life given to us in Jesus Christ and not some synthetic, half-baked, half-built, half-true, worthless version of life. Jesus, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.